Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have a Bible and want to go ahead and turn over there, Matthew chapter 2. Have you ever caught a piece of a conversation and not gotten the full context of it? And, and it just left you with a lot of questions in life. Uh, I got myself in, in, in that situation a couple of times this past week. My buddy Kurt and I had rode together to a preacher's meeting uh, out, and uh, we were sitting at a restaurant with a bunch of preachers. We're sitting there, and a waitress comes up to him, seemingly out of the blue, and here's how she starts the conversation. She said, I need some honey. And without batting an eye, he said, I'm your man. She said, out in your truck? He pointed across the table at me and said, no, I'm with him today. She said, all right, maybe next time, and she walked off. Now, I knew the context of this, but I looked at the preacher sitting beside me, and he did not know the context of this. <laughs> His eyes were real big, and he, he looked over, and he said, a little bit of context this conversation will go a long way. I said, let me, let me give you the real quick uh, addition here. Kurt raises bees. He sells honey. He keeps it in his truck in bottles. And when people he runs into want to buy it, he sells it to them. He rode here with me. He ain't with me. He rode here with me. And that's, that's the whole context of the conversation. I gave Kurt the devil for that conversation on the way home. Then I found myself in a bad situation the same evening. That evening, Fran was in the kitchen. She was cooking some cinnamon rolls that were supposed to go out uh, the next day for somebody. She came in and she said, oh, I got to run, run to food line. I said, what's wrong? I said, well, I've, I'm out of brown sugar. I said, ain't no big deal. I'll, I'll run down there and get it. Being the loving, kind, generous husband that I am, I was going to leave the house. I'll run down to food line. Well, I don't go to food line very often. I don't shop very often. Don't know where anything is, but I walk in, I uh, walk in the food line and there's a, uh, there's a couple ladies up there, a couple young girls up at the, at the one register that was open. There wasn't many people in there. There wasn't even anybody at the register. I spoke to them uh, real quick and just said, Hey, I walked past the register and I, love those signs up there. They're for dumb people like me that don't ever go to the food line. And I can look and get a general idea of where I'm supposed to go. So I was sitting there just past the registers and I was staring at the signs, just hoping for some clue as to where I might find what I was looking for in the bacon section or something other. And, and I hear a voice behind me and uh, it's a young black girl that was working at the, uh, at, at the register. And that's important why I said it like that in just a second. And uh, she she said, what you looking? I said, I'm looking some brown sugar. <laughs> About the time it come out my mouth, I realized what I just said. My face turned as red as that poinsettia. And I turned around real slow and she was smiling. She said, are you now? <laughs> she said, aisle four. So I went over to aisle four and I had to think of whether or not I really needed that brown sugar or if I just wanted to just slip out the back door out the emergency exit. I hope there's one back there. I was going to make one. If not, I just wanted to go home instead of relive the embarrassment of that. But I was like, you know, I'm in it now. So I got the brown sugar and went back up. And of course, there's only one line open and I had to go right there. And the whole time she sat there checking me out and she was smiling this big. I got home and told Fran, I said, I don't care what you need next time. You're going to the grocery store. You know, context is so important. Just about anything you say or anything you do if it's not seen or, or done or heard within the right context, it can give off another meaning and it can really put us in a bind. Well, with that in mind, when God was introducing us to his son, Jesus, in the gospel of Matthew, he sets the scene for us by giving us a very solid context that we could build our faith upon. You know, we're, we're going to be looking at a pretty lengthy passage of Scripture this morning, the first 18 verses of Matthew chapter 2. But I want to look at it in three different sections as, as Matthew lays out for us uh, very systematically three pieces of context that he sets the foundation that we can build our faith in Jesus upon. If you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 2, the Scripture starts in verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he called together all the, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they replied, in Bethlehem in Judea, for it is written, the prof, for the, this is what is written in the prophets. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. So right as Matthew is about to introduce us to Jesus before he ever performs a miracle, before he ever preaches a sermon, before he ever does anything, we're, we get the context that Jesus is a historical figure. There's three key pieces there in those first, uh, in those first six verses that point to Jesus being simply a historical figure. Now, for what we're about to read in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew and really the rest of the New Testament, that's an important thing. Because if Jesus was not perpetrated here and the context given of him being a real, live, historical figure, it would be easy to think, oh, this is just some fictional character that somebody's made up. He's like a, a superhero that does good in the name of God. But Matthew wants to establish here, the Lord wants to establish that Jesus is a real historical figure. So he mentions three things. First off, it tells us that he's born in the city of Bethlehem, a very specific place. Then it says that he was born at a very specific time during the reign of King Herod. Now we know from historical records that King Herod reigned from 37 BC until about 4 AD. So that's a specific time. And then even more specifically, we read uh, this line about Herod in there. It says that when he was disturbed, all Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Well, when you go back and study the history of that time period uh, and, and look at some things around Herod, we see that this guy, he was a lunatic. Th this guy was a very, um, he, he, he was always dreaming things up that uh, very paranoid mindset that people were going to come in and overtake his throne and he wasn't going to be able to be king anymore. He was so paranoid that throughout his reign of king, he ended up killing three of his own sons that he thought were going to raise up and, and overtake his throne. So later on, when we read that all Jerusalem was disturbed with them, it makes a lot of sense. They had seen how this guy had acted before. And later on in the text that we're going to get to in just a little bit, we see that he even issued a decree that children two years and younger in the vicinity of Bethlehem would be put to death because he was afraid that somebody was going to raise up this new king, this king that was born in Bethlehem was going to raise up and take his throne. So Jesus is presented to us right off the bat as a historical figure. And there was something key in our text that's mentioned there that took place that was observable in history and that's documented in, in, in extra biblical history that we can just pick up a history book from that time and, and read about. And that was the star that was in the East. Uh, this star that appeared in the east, it was observed by many. Matthew mentions it in our text. There's other Jewish uh, historians. Josephus one, is one of them that mentions this star that appeared in, in, in the east. And in addition to that, we have two completely different cultures mentioned in seeing this thing in their, in their history books as well. There's Egyptian historians as well as Chinese historians that have records, historical records that tell us around the time of Jesus' birth, there was an extraordinarily bright star that appeared in the sky and it stayed there for a long time. Now, for us as Christians, we come in here every Sunday because we come to worship Jesus as our Lord and our Savior because the Bible instructs us to do that. That's why we've come to do that this morning. But even if you remove the Bible from the equation... There's enough historical evidence to prove that Jesus was a real historical figure. He was born in a specific place at a specific time, and there was a major specific event that was all surrounding, uh, all surrounding his, uh, his life. So Matthew lays that out as the first foundation for us putting our faith in him, is that this is a real historical man. This isn't just some fairy tale that's been, that's been made up. Now, thankfully, when when we come together as Christians, we aren't just here because Jesus is a historic figure. We're here because he's a saving figure. We're here to worship him because he is our savior. And that's what the next few verses teach us. If you've got your Bible still open, look at verses 7 through 12. It says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. 
He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report him to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, what he had said, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of frankincense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now Jesus, or now Matthew rather, is setting the context of Jesus for us, not from a historical perspective, but he's showing that Jesus, he came for a specific purpose. Jesus' stated purpose for coming was to seek and save that which is lost. That's every one of us. Okay, every one of us, he's come to save us and be our savior. And if you look at the gifts that were brought to him and presented to him, you'll see that those are the gifts of a of a savior. Three gifts. The very first gift uh, was a gift of gold, which was a typical, a customary gift for kings. Then you've got frankincense. It was a customary gift uh, for those priests that served in the temple worship. And then finally, the gift of myrrh, it was... Uh, it, it was like a perfume that was used um, in, in burial, the burial process. So it would have been the equivalent of gifting a baby boy uh, some embalming fluid. Now that that seems like a terrible gift to, to give a baby. It seems like uh, Mary might should have reached out and smacked him. But there was there was some context here, and there was some reasons. And all through Jesus' life, uh, as his life kind of culminated. On the cross of Calvary, we can look back from that point and, and we're able to do that with, you know, hindsight. And we can see that these gifts are very obvious. They have some very obvious meanings and, and reasoning behind them. As, as Jesus hung on the cross, you remember the sign that hung over his head? Hail Jesus, what did it say? King of the Jews. So that's why he was crucified, because he was king of the Jews. Later on in Revelation 17, 14, we're told that he's not only king of the Jews, but he's also king of kings and he's Lord of lords. So that gift of gold was very appropriate for, for King Jesus. That second gift of frankincense, it was appropriate uh, as well. It was something that the priests would often use in the temple for worship. Well, the book of Hebrews lays out the significance of that. It tells us that Jesus is not only just our high priest, but he's also the sacrificial lamb that gave his life for the forgiveness of our sins. His life is that fragrant offering that the priest would give to God. His life is that fragrant offering to God that's that's given to God for our salvation. So that frankincense was a very appropriate gift for Jesus. And then that last gift of myrrh is, is very obviously significant as well. It was used in those ancient ancient burial uh, uh, burial rituals and it was an appropriate gift for Jesus because it would be through his death on the cross, through his sacrifice for our sins, that, uh, that he shed his blood. And that would give us all the reason that we need to celebrate him, not just as a historical, save, or a historical figure, but also as the savior of our souls. So he's king, he's priest, he's our savior. He's our Savior. That's the picture here. That's the context that Matthew is introducing Jesus to us as. He's introducing him as a historical figure. He's also introducing him as our Savior. But in my mind, the most, the most powerful evidence that we have for coming to worship Jesus as the Son of God and as our Savior, is, it takes place in the next section. All throughout the Old Testament, we have a Messiah that was prophesied. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. We were told uh, that out of woman would come uh, a Messiah, a Savior, and he would crush Satan's skull and it would only bruise his heel. He would recover from this very quickly. And we get glimpses all through the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, uh, about what when Jesus would be born and where he would be born and the kind of life that he would live, even the kind of death that he would live, all sorts of events, very uh, minute details about his life were prophesied, all of them at least 650 years before he was ever even born. And, and then Matthew here, at the time of the birth of Jesus, shows us how Jesus came and fulfilled all these prophecies. Now, he doesn't mention all of them in our text, but I just want to give you a sample. And starting in verse 13, 
It says, when they, had gone, uh, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, he took the child and his mother during the night, and he left for Egypt. And when he had stayed until, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I will call my son. We're going to see those words again in just a minute. So was fulfilled what the prophet had said. If you keep reading in verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and, uh, and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah... It was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. I love this section. I love as, as Matthew is setting the context for Jesus, uh, who Jesus is. He doesn't just show us that he's a historical figure. He doesn't just show us that he's come to save us, but he gives us some overwhelming evidence. He shows us that Jesus is the promised Jesus. He's the promised Messiah. I love this because I've had doubts about this before. How many of you have ever, how many of you have ever doubted God in your life? How many of you have ever doubted something that you've, you, you've seen in the Bible or, or you've seen God do in life and maybe even had some doubts about uh, who his son Jesus was or what the Bible says uh, about his son Jesus? I see a lot of you kind of sl slid that hand up when I asked you if you've ever had doubts and others of you are shaking your head. We have... We had a term back where I grew up for, uh, in, in, for others of you that did not. We called that a lion cur dog. Lion cur dog is one that he'll go up and he's barking up a tree and he's saying there's a squirrel or a coon up there, but there really ain't. He's barking up the wrong tree. And I believe anybody that says they've never had doubts in life, you're barking up the wrong tree. Every one of us has had doubts. And... That's one of the beautiful things about the prophets. And Matthew's doing that in our text for this morning. Is he's laying that foundation by, by removing all of our doubts. He's given us some powerful evidence. Over 750 years before Jesus was born. The prophet Hosea prophesied that he would spend time in the nation of Egypt. Now that doesn't, might not seem significant to you. But as a Jewish family going to Egypt, that's a pretty big deal. Because if you go back in history and, and read the book of Exodus, they had been enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. The, the Jewish people, they still hated the Egyptians for what they'd done to them in their past. And for that prophecy to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ, it is a huge piece of evidence that Jesus was this promised Messiah. 600 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied that sometime during the time surrounding the Savior's birth would a major tragedy come upon women of mothers specifically in that region. Well, we see what that was with, uh, it, it was a terrible event when Herod, issued that decree that all the male children two years and younger be put to death in the vicinity of Bethlehem. But it was also a, a huge fulfillment of prophecy there. We stopped reading before we get to it, but 19 through the end of chapter 2, if you keep reading there, it's prophesied that when Joseph brought his family out of Egypt and back into Israel, that they would settle down in the town of Nazareth and, and that Jesus would be called uh, a Nazarene. Well, 750 years before Jesus was ever born, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be raised in Nazareth. Nazareth. Just, just one more piece of evidence that God gives us through the prophets. All this hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, these details were predicted. Now, you couple that with the prophecies that we've got about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, of him being born of a virgin, of the star in the east, of the evidence. And you look at all that evidence, and it's just overwhelming that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He's a historical figure who came to save us, but he is the promised Messiah. That's Matthew's introduction about who Jesus is. All the miracles that he ever performed, all the messages that he ever preached, all the, all the people that he ever healed, the life that he lived, all of that is on the basis of these three things. 
Jesus is a historical figure. Jesus came to save us, and Jesus was prophesied for hundreds of years before his birth. And it is on the evidence of these scriptures that Matthew lays out for us as a foundation that we put our faith in him as our Lord. I love the Christmas story, but it's more than just a nice story. This is a transformational story. It changed history, and it can change your life. If you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and you've never accepted him as your Savior, you've got the evidence for you right there in, in the Word of God. It's laid out for you clearly. I ask it, we're going to sing an invitation hymn in just a second. And, and I ask that if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, make that commitment today. The Scripture tells us to put our faith in him, uh, to repent of our sins, to be baptized into his name, uh, to confess him as our Lord, to live a life uh, of faithfulness to him. If you've never taken these steps and entered into that covenant, why don't you come this morning as we stand and as we sing together.